Gospel of Luke, Dr. Luke, all right, chapter 13, Luke chapter 13. We're down one piano player. My daughter uh, was playing, not playing, actually with uh, holding one of our dogs back from playing with another puppy that was over at our house, and some ha- something happened. I heard, Dad, I looked up, and, and she was holding her uh, right hand up at me, and I think I broke my finger, <laughs> and so it was kind of off to an angle, and so it sure enough was broken. So we were in the emergency room until about 11 o'clock last night, but she is good spirits, and uh, we have a really sick house. Uh, I'm talking about crazy sick because, I mean, there was a laughter after she did that, um, so um, by her and uh, starting. So anyway, the launderers, I, please forgive us, we're just weird, and, uh, but she is doing well, and I thank the Lord for that, and uh, she's hopefully going to uh, be able to get back to the piano in good time. Luke 13, and uh, we are, um, we're actually working through just a series of messages the Lord puts in our heart to, um, to have uh, really an insight to some conversations that are taking place between the Lord Jesus Christ and just different various people, uh, insightful conversations. This is a little bit different, uh, this particular, because it's not really a conversation. Uh, there were some statements that were made to the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 13, and then there were some statements made from the Lord Jesus Christ to those people, and then there was a parable given. Now, it's almost rapid fire when you get from verses 1 through 9, and, and yet there's a profound uh, meaning here uh, to the New Testament church. And I really want to help you today. Uh, the title of the message this morning is What to Do with Bad News. Uh, subtitle is Are You Ready for an Inspection? Uh, and it's really a, a strange uh, uh, comparison between the first five verses of this chapter and the, 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 the next couple of verses that goes into the parable, but it's very interesting. And uh, in the military, we had occasionally we would have inspections. You all know any military guy understand inspections, and, and uh, we didn't like inspections, but inspections were uh, really the place they can come and just kind of make sure things are tidy, things are right. And uh, whether it's either formation or going into the rooms, doing white glove and all that stuff. Uh, but the church, um, there, there's an inspection. Uh, there's a time coming where there's going to be an inspection. And I was looking at this, uh, this text here, uh, unpacking this this morning, asking God to really give us some insight uh, to, uh, to the first five verses and really understand the parable and the meaning of the parable that is given uh, in the next four after that. Look at verse number one together. There were present at that season some that told of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or... Of those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And it seems to almost transition here in verse number 6, but it's, it's building on what was already spoken. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, uh, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also until I dig about it. And dung it. And if, the, if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. You pray with me and for me this morning. Our Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We do respect and honor the word of God. I pray you'd help us, Lord, to, in our own actions, in our own lives, would take inventory of, of what we're doing. 
I know there's an inspection coming, God. I pray you'd help your people as we are looking at the events in this world that are ticking away and giving us yet another indicator of the times that we're living, signs of the times. And I pray, God, you would give us what we need today. Help us, Lord, to leave here a changed people, challenged people. I pray for the one this morning that's here occasionally. I pray for the one this morning that is here all the time, and yet their heart many times can be cold and indifferent. I pray for the one here this morning that doesn't even uh, have a concern about the things of this world. We pray, God, for those this morning that are here that have their Bibles, that are anticipating here to hear from you. I ask God you touch our hearts. We're a needy people. We're a deceived people. We can be very cold and indifferent. And I pray, God, you would arrest our attention and change us. And bring us out of the complacent spirit that we can so easily find ourselves brought into. And may we leave here challenged this morning, renewed vigor, a renewed spirit, Lord, uh, Lord, to live for you. Give us grace to be fruitful in the lives that we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, there's a website that I occasionally go to. It is a liberal website, uh, but it is the Doomsday Clock website. <laughs> And if you look at the Doomsday Clock website, it's all liberals that all put that whole thing together. And we, we preachers go to it once in a while. It's just very interesting because they, they take all the factors in the world, uh, world hunger, the uh, geopolitical instability, and five right now, five major countries in, in Africa alone, and uh, with, without even going into Europe. They look at future p pandemics, the rise of another outbreak, and climate change, and the, all the challenges of the threat of nuclear war, all those things. They kind of put all that together and they come up with a, a sort of a time clock of where we're at in terms of when everything's going to end, doomsday. And meaning that at 12 midnight, it's going to be over. And uh, the doomsday clock was, re, if you would, recalibrated to show 100 seconds to midnight. And, uh, and I look at that and I thought to myself, even the lost world, and I know they have motives behind it. They have agendas behind all of that material that they put out, but they understand and recognize something pro that we all know biblically is coming, and that is there is an end. There is a cataclysmic end. There is a, a time of trouble that has not ever been in this world and uh, that will uh, come to this world. And I, I know this, that even if you look at the whole world history, any history buff understands this, that the world has been pretty much from the fall of man 6,000 years ago, uh, unstable and, uh, and really unpredictable. <laughs> we, we've literally gone from one tragedy to another, to another, to another. We've been dancing from tragedy to tragedy all down through human history, war after war, famine after famine, heartache after heartache, vo volcano after volcano, and tsunami, and all these things that have hit this world. And uh, that's just what we live in. I remember when I was... Uh, uh, just a little boy, third grade, and some of you in my age, maybe a little older, uh, remember that you used to have nuclear war drills. Y'all remember that? Uh, maybe it's just, a, yeah, nuclear war drills. And we, we had just like the, what the kids have today. You would also, now you have school shooting drills and all that. But, uh, but I remember those. I remember we would have the fire drill. Well, we all kind of look forward to the fire drills because we would get out and kind of play with our friends out there in the grass and then, you know, and, you know look at our lunch boxes and everything like that and go, because we always, I always grab my lunch, man. No way. As a kid leaving the fire, I don't care if that building, but I want my, I want my lunch. So, and so we would all make sure our lunch boxes were intact. Amen. And, uh, and so we had tornado drills, and uh, in the tornado drills, you go to the hallway, everyone sits down against the block walls, put your head between your knees and wait for the wind, the wind to pass and all that stuff. But when we had the nuclear drills, we'd all get under our desk and really wait to be incinerated. <laughs> That's really, really nothing you could do about that. Just, uh, you're going to be gone. And, uh, and we, we all talked about that. It was kind of a reality. It still is a reality today. But you look at Luke chapter 13, and consider that there are things that they face that we face today, only, I believe, on a larger scale, much larger scale. And when you look at Luke chapter 13, I believe when you see 
this text, you'll find the cause of these issues. And I believe there's a reason for the tragedies that are facing us every day. We hear them, we see them, they're visual, but there's a reason for them also. And I look at this and, and uh, Luke 13 really brings us right into our culture and where we're at today. And I love Luke's style, writing under the inspiration of the whole, very detailed uh, writer as the ins, under, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and uh, he's very interesting when you look at uh, what he mentions here. Not mentioned in any other gospel, by the way, this particular uh, event. So verse 1 says, they were present at that season. Now, this was a very busy thing. There's, in fact, there's a little bit of an uprising when you look in chapter 12. There's, there's, not, there's a little bit of a, a kind of an uprising here and a little busyness, so to speak, a little tense uh, situation. And out of all that, we are introduced to chapter 13. And it says, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And this phrase here that is mentioned that this blood Pilate mingled uh, with their sacrifices is that uh, there's uh, their blood that they were shedding for a sacrifice was mingled with their own blood. So this would be, if you would, a massacre in church, uh, a massacre in the temple. Galileans going in with their sacrifices, uh, blood sacrifices to worship God and Pilate for some reason, it's not detailed here. It was just front page Galilean news that Pilate killed them. Pilate came in, slaughtered them. It was quick. It was unpredictable. It was something that uh, uh, was out of the normal. It would be equivalent to a, a church shooting today. Something that was uh, totally un, uh, unpre unpredictable. It just a guy came in and started shooting people. This was what happened here in the Galileans. R again, right front page news uh, is what's happened. Now look at the response the Lord Jesus Christ gives. We're going to highlight this in just a little bit. But note here that the Lord could have said, "Wow, yeah, I did hear about that. That is bad news. You need to go get yourself a sword." You know, you need to get to the gun store real quick. You better get loaded up. You, you, you need to get some extra ammo. Are you all with me this morning? This doesn't say that. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ does something that uh, puts it back on them that were telling him of this tragedy that just took place. Verse number two. And Jesus answering and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. He says, let me just cut to the chase because I know what you're thinking. He says, you're thinking that because this happened to them, they must be really, really bad people. In fact, I know the reason why you're coming to me. Uh, this uh, apparently is something that you're thinking. You're just assuming that if these Galileans died that way. They must have done something really bad in their childhood. They must have been having some secret sins. And so that's the reason why they were killed in church. And so, Pastor, does that really exist? It existed then and it exists today. Remember in John chapter 6 where the man was born blind and his disciples asked, who did sin, this man or his parents? Somebody has to be blamed for this. It's somebody's fault. It's either this man or his parents, but somebody is the culprit. This just doesn't happen, and yet it does. And so, so when you look at this, he brought then a very interesting response. Look at verse number 4. Let me give you one, he says, in Verse number four, uh, or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them. You think ye that, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? So he says, you know, you give me a, 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 a front page story. Let me give you one. How about the one uh, story where that tower fell and 18 people killed? Now you think those 18 people are maybe worse than others? Are you all here this morning? So this is not a normal response by a tragic story. He's giving them, if you would, an indication of what he's going to hit in verse number six. Because when you get to this parable and unpack the meaning of the parable, it's all conditional on this. So when I look at the two events that were mentioned, Galileans that were murdered by Pilate and the 18 that were killed in the tower of Siloam that fell, both were apparently unexpected. 
I mean, the people that went into the temple had no idea that they were going to be there at church for the last time. That's the last day they were going to be alive. They had no idea. Bringing their sacrifices to God. They were probably singing the Psalms as he walked into the temple. They were excited about their sacrifices being brought to God. And then all of a sudden, here comes Pilate's men with swords drawn. And they started slaughtering these men. Mingling the blood of the sacrifices with their own blood. Had no idea. Total surprise. The other one, again, total surprise. 18 people perished. In a collapse of a building. And you remember, you understand, apparently one was an accident and one was, uh, it was intentional. And guys, listen, ladies, listen. We deal with those two types of tragedies all the time. We deal with intentional tragedies. Before I finish this sermon, there could be another shooting here in America in church. I know there will be a shooting somewhere in America by some perpetrator onto someone else. I know someone most likely will be killed by the end of the day by a murderer. Intentional, unwelcome, yes, but intentional tragedy will take place today. The Bible says in the last days, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. It's going to get worse tomorrow than it is today. I'm not trying to lay you down on the railroad tracks. I am simply saying tonight, today that there is evil in the world. It's always been here, but it's increasing in the last days. And there are some that are accident. Accidents. It just happened. Both of these were unexpected. Both tragedies had multiple casualties. I'm thinking of the tower that fell or the condos that collapsed in, in, uh, in, uh, in Miami-Dade County when, when, when 159 people right now are still, still missing and fires burning inside the rubble of, of, of that what was a condo at one time. And so you can imagine tragedies after tragedies after tragedies. And they're saying in recent years, the widespread tragedies have nothing but increased. I, I think about the 2011 footage of the tsunami that came onto the mainland Japan and the dis widespread destruction that that tsunami just created and taking in minutes over 15,000 people's lives die, killed from a tragedy. Unexpected. Man-made, there's man-made tragedies. One that we all know is 9-11 and, and almost 3,000 of our American citizens were killed in a man-made attack on our own soil. You all remember in 2004, I remember coming to church that day, we were all just stunned at the tsunami that in minutes killed 230,000 people. They say that was one of the most deadliest disasters in modern history. Tragedies. I read a story, UN News reported that natural disasters occurring, listen to this, three times more often than 50 years ago. That's measurable. So can I just say this? Biblically speaking, the Bible is very clear that in the last days, there's going to be more wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and earthquakes and diverse places and kingdom rising against kingdom. And, and uh, it's going to be, if you would, worse tomorrow than it is today. You all with me on that? Shootings daily. There's predictions of civil unrest and now food shortages because of the drought out west and story after story of record uh, uh, breaking temperatures out there to already depleted resources and water. There's wars right now, at least property wars of having water rights and they're having to take the cattle and kill them because they have no way to, to feed the cattle out there. And there's going to be most likely food shortages coming in addition to the other shortages that we're having. Record droughts out. Listen, can I just go down? We can go down the list of news after news after news, of tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. What do you do with bad news? And are you ready for the inspection? The world is under a sin curse right now. Every man, every woman, every child is under a sin curse. Every nation is under a sin curse. Every home, every church is subjected to the sin curse. So look what the Lord Jesus Christ does here. 
He turns it on them in verse number two and verse number four. And he, if you would, unpacks the reality of what happens when we hear bad news. And ladies and gentlemen, you're going to turn me off right here. So please, please stay with me. Okay? Stay with me on this. He, 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 he turns this whole thing and he asks them this question. Do you think that they were worse sinners because this happened to them? That's, if you would, the gist of what he said in verse number two and four. In fact, it says in ver- almost word for word, because they suffered such things in verse two and verse number four, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem. Now listen to this. Disaster can either cause us to react one of two ways. Either number one, we can be distracted from our own need or we can be drawn to our own need. That's what Jesus is saying. Look in verse number three and verse number five. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Look at verse five. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Same quote, okay, to the same, same response to different disasters. He's not saying, I want to say this real quick. He's not saying, hey, listen, you better, you better repent or you're going to be killed when you go to church. He is not saying you better repent or the next time you go in a building, it's going to fall on you. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, listen, you ought to be ready to go at any time. No matter what it is. <laughs> you ought to be ready to go when you get in that car. You ought to be ready to go when you, uh, when you take that trip. You ought to be ready to go when you go to bed tonight. You ought to be ready to go at any time. That's what he's saying. Because it's unpredictable. And I know there's all kinds of ways that people leave. A million different ways people leave this world. People leave this world all drawn out. Some leave this world quick and fast. Some leave in pain. Others leave with no pain at all. But all the calamities and tragedies and pandemics that we're presented with. All those disasters after disasters that we have to deal with. We need to consider one of life's most important questions this morning is that what are we doing as we're getting closer to the end? There's an inspection coming. What are you doing with the bad news? Skipping for time, I'm going to move you right into this, this statement here. He just tells his disciples to, to, to repent, and so they, uh, they don't die unprepared. They're going to stand before a holy God And then he starts this parable. He says, yes, I know about that story in Jerusalem. I know about that story there in Jerusalem with Siloam. I understand all the tragedies. He says, what about you? He says, let me tell you a parable. You don't understand what a parable is. A parable is is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Parables are powerful, man. When you look at a parable, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke over 40 parables in the Bible, and he spoke all of them. In other words, no one else in the Bible spoke a parable. Only Christ did. And he spoke over 40 of them. And they're very insightful. Some are very prophetic. They have prophecy. But they're giving meaning to a heavenly truth. And I know this. When you get to the story here, think about the the spiritual condition of where Israel is today. This is very important during this time. It's very important to understand. Before this parable is given, this is a, almost a dead religion. People were sort of going through the motions. Worship became heartless. Uh, their, 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 their time with Christ, uh, uh, when you get to the, the time of Christ, when the Lord Jesus Christ is on the scene, uh, they were just sort of going through the motions. They, they, there's evidence that they were full of corruption. Jesus actually referred to the religious leaders as, as those that had whited sepulchers. They, they, they looked They looked good on the outside, but they were just full of dead man's bones on the inside. They had the right words, but they did not have the right heart, according to Matthew chapter 15. And so by the time that the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene, they were so indifferent to the things of God that the wise men, when they came into Jerusalem seeking the the, uh, the king of the Jews, they had no idea. The Bible says Jerusalem was all troubled. And very few people even went out to Bethlehem to even see what this was. They were indifferent to the first coming of Christ. They were indifferent to the advent of the Savior. They just didn't care. They were just too busy. The temple became a den of thieves, the Bible says. So that's why this parable is going to be given to them. 
He says in verse number six, and he spake this parable. Now listen, this is very, very powerful. Stay with me. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And he said, then said he unto his dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Now, who is this? Look in verse 7 of Isaiah 5. Hold your finger there. Go back to the Old Testament quickly. Isaiah chapter number 7, or chapter 5. How many are okay with the Bible study? Real quick here. Amen. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 7. Let's find out who the owner of this vineyard is. Isaiah 5, 7. Are you all there? Here's some pages turning. You got to see this. Isaiah 5, 7 says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is what? Okay. So who's the, who's the vineyard? Who's the owner of the vineyard? It's the Lord of hosts. Now, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the army. Okay. The Lord of hosts, a powerful military God. Amen. A military leader. Lord of hosts. He is the God of the universe. And he owns a vineyard. And the vineyard is the house of Israel. Okay. So we understand based on Isaiah 5, 7, it's pretty interestingly, to, you can deduce that the owner of the man, the man who owned it, is God himself. Look, if you would, to Hosea chapter 9. Already mentioned Isaiah 5, but it's good to kind of uh, unpack a couple of the verses. This will be called verse crunching. Okay? Crunching verses. What does that mean? You're cross-referencing right now. I love cross-referencing. You're going from one area of the Bible to another area of the Bible and cross-referencing. The Bible talks about how to study the Bible. No scripture, the Bible says, of any private interpretation. We compare spiritual with spiritual, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's Bible study. That's what we're doing right now. Look, if you would, in Hosea 9.10. The prophet Hosea says, I found Israel like what? Grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the what? In the fig tree at her first time. So a very interesting, not really obscure reference to the fathers of Israel, okay, being that of the first ripe of the fig tree, a second reference. If you would, go back to Jeremiah. Hang a, hang a left there. Go to Jeremiah 24. Jeremiah 24. All right. Okay, we know God is the one in charge of the vineyard. The vineyard is Israel. Jeremiah 24, we'll back that up. It's reference here uh, to bad figs and good figs in verse number two. One basket had very good figs, uh, even like the figs in the first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Can I just say this? There are bad members and there are good members in every church. It's true, okay? Now, the idea and the hope is that you have a church full of good members. I mean, members that have good fruit. And then you have members that have no fruit. They're just bad fruit. It's just nasty fruit. You can't even eat them. They're horrible. I mean, just rotten. That's what he's saying about Israel. He said, you got, you got, you got some good fruit. You got some that are not so good. In fact, they're naughty. He goes on to say in verse number 3, then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, and good figs, and very good, and, and uh, the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, these, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this people into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. It's interesting here, even the good, the good figs got carried away to Babylon. Very interesting phrase there. So watch this. When you're looking at this parable, you see very clearly that we're dealing with the nation of Israel. The primary interpretation of Luke 13, verses 5 through 9, he's dealing with the nation of Israel. These are, this is the fig tree. 
Now watch this. It gets really interesting when you start to unpack this even further. Look in Isaiah chapter number 42. I love asking the Bible questions. And I, I say, Lord, so what's the fruit? Okay, so you're looking for fruit. God was looking for fruit. He said, now three years I've come by and I put this fig tree in the ground. And every year I've come by and I'm looking for fruit and I'm not seeing any fruit. So the dresser of the vineyard, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, he says to the owner of the vineyard, listen, let me, let me dig it, let me dunk it, let me put some fertilizer around there for one more year, and then if it doesn't produce any fruit, just go ahead and, and just cut it down then. Are you all with me this morning? So there's an attempt here by the dresser to keep it going, to try to keep, get this thing to produce some fruit. Now, we understand God is the owner of the vineyard. We understand the vineyard is the nation of Israel. But what's the fruit? Oh, this gets good. I hope I don't bore you. But Isaiah 42, verse number 6. says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. I will keep thee. I will give thee for a covenant of the people. Now, look at this. For a light to, of the what? Gentiles. So Israel is to be a light of the Gentiles. Watch this. I said, what, what's God? What do you want Israel to do? Israel was entrusted with the oracles of God, the laws of God, the worship of God. They were entrusted with the, the very person of God. They were entrusted with the tabernacle. They were given the instructions from God on how he was going to be approached. They were given miracle after miracle of God's provision for them in the wilderness and all those miracles that God gave them. Okay? But the purpose was they were going to be a light of the Gentiles. Then, if you would, Isaiah 49. Hang it right there. Isaiah 49, verse 6. There's a lot more here that we don't have time to cover. Look in verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of who? Okay. Of Jacob. Okay. We got Abraham, Isaac, and who? Jacob. Okay. This is Israel. And to restore the preserved of Israel, I will also give thee for a light to the what? Gentiles. Do you realize this morning that if we did not have, okay, if we did not have light given to us in some way, if we did not follow the light that God is, we right here, be in a pagan temple bringing our sacrifices to some God that we're lighting a fire under to burn our babies in front of all the congregation. So, Pastor, would you do that? They did do that. That's what pagans did. I knocked doors in Finley here and occasionally come across the pagan. I'm a pagan. I said, you don't understand what a pagan is. You know what pagans do. They worship deities. They worship Baal Peor. They worship anything but God. And we as Gentiles were descendants of those pagans. The Jewish people were given the oracles of one God, one true God. And so I want you, Israel, to be a light to the Gentiles. They have no idea. They're in darkness, but you have light. So I want you to be a light to the Gentiles. Look in Isaiah chapter 60 real quick. It says here, and I know this is a prophecy, but look what the prophecy says, Isaiah 60 and verse number 3. And the Gentiles shall come to what? Thy light, and the kings of the brightness of thy rising. So we understand, according to the Bible, that the purpose of Israel was to bring light, to bring light to Gentiles who were darkness. Now, look in Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. Paul's preaching here. He's in Antioch. He's specifically on the Sabbath day, which would be a Saturday. He's in Antioch. He's in the, the synagogue, and he's now going to preach. And he starts to preach largely to a Jewish congregation. Now watch what this says. Verse number 14, Acts 13, actually verse number 16. Then Paul stood up beckoning with his hand, and men of Israel, I have, my, I have it underlined, that word Israel, ye that fear God, give audience, listen to this. So I'm going to give you something you need to know. He starts to preach to them because of time. I don't have all the time. Look at verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, 
men and brethren, verse 38, that through this man, that's Jesus, is preached unto you for the forgiveness of sins. And by him all believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which was spoken of in the prophets. And that would be Isaiah 6, verses 9 through 10. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. It's interesting, though. I just want to say this to those that have a belief that God does not give choice. They're given choice right there. Beware. Paul said, beware, because the prophecies that were predicted about you, don't let them, don't let, them, don't let it come to pass. <laughs> don't let it happen. Beware, beware, choice. But look in verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out in the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. <laughs> Gentile says, we like the message. <laughs> it's like the guy leaves the church saying, man, that was a good message. I'm coming back tonight. And the person that <laughs> leaves church, I'll never come back to this church. I can't stand that preacher. I don't like that message. When the Gentiles left synagogue, they say, I don't know what you preached in there, but I want to hear it. Can you come and do that again next week? Sure enough. Now, when this congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next day, they came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. How about that? Can you imagine all Finley being out here? And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with what? Envy. Verse number 45. Why would they be envious? Mm-mm-mm. And he spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It is necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing that you have put it away, uh, rather put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the what? Now watch this, ladies and gentlemen. This, this parable in Luke chapter 13 is being fulfilled right here. He says, listen, he says, the vineyard, the owner of the vineyard, he's, he's looked for fruit for three years. He hasn't found it. The dresser says, I've, give me one year. Let me dig it. Let me dung it. And then come in. If it doesn't produce fruit, then cut it down. Okay? Y'all with me? The purpose of the nation of Israel, in addition to the oracles of God and the laws of God, was to be a light to the Gentiles. And they get envious that Jesus Christ is being preached. Paul said, well, it's going to the Gentiles now. Look at verse number 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord that as many were ordained to eternal life believed. Whoa, we got into this thing. This is not even our covenant. God made a covenant with Israel and let us in on it. Woo, glory to God. It's a Jewish Messiah you're believing in. Amen. And how many Jew, full Jews we have here? None. We're all Gentiles. Watch this. This is a prophecy. So God, in this prophecy, in this parable, is trying to get this tree to produce fruit. That's why he sent John, John the Baptist, preaching fruits of repentance. John's in there saying, get, get right, the kingdom of heaven's coming. Get right, repent, therefore. And he starts to preach the fruits of repentance. You're dead. Your spirituality is dead. You're vain in your worship. You're robbing God of his tithes and offerings. There's, there's a mess here. Get right. Okay, that's what the parable is given to. But the most dangerous part of the parable is the fact that there's a time element attached to it. That's why when you look at this parable in Luke 13, go back there real quick. I already mentioned it, but I think it's very important to re-see this. In verse 7, verse 7, Luke 13. Stay with me. I'm going to wrap this thing up in about four hours. We'll be okay. <laughs> then said he unto the dressers of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Now remember, the Lord Jesus Christ, his earthly ministry lasted for three and a half years, right? Okay, he began his earthly ministry in Galilee, but every year the Lord Jesus Christ with every other Jew will go down to the temple once a year and worship God. Okay? So every year he would come down to the temple, nothing's changed. There's no, they're still robbing God in the, in the there's still corruption, there's still whited sepulchers, nothing's changing in the years. Every missionary, without exception, every missionary that we support says the same thing. 
Every time they come back to America, America is worse, spiritually speaking. Every America, and I think you, Jane could probably attest to that. Being away from America, coming back to America after a number of years, they could say the churches are in worse condition, the people's spiritual condition is worse, sin is expanded even more every year. Y'all with me? It is noticeable, it is measurable. So here for three years, the Lord Jesus Christ would come back to Jerusalem to obviously, as every Jewish male would do, to worship God. And every year, there's no fruit. Year after year after year, nothing's changing. The time element. So this seems to indicate that the dresser of the vineyard says, I'm done. Cut it down. Rather, the, the, the owner of the vineyard said, cut it down. The dresser of the vineyard, the Lord Jesus Christ says, let me, let, me, let, me, let me fertilize it. Let me dig it. Now, you understand the fertilization that the Lord Jesus Christ put on this thing? Miracle after miracle after miracle. That's some good fertilizer. <laughs> Y'all hear? I mean, when someone's walking on the water, that's a pretty good fertilizer. I mean, I don't know if that fertilized your spiritual life, but that would get me and my attention. I mean, if someone came down here this morning and said, you know, I'm going to walk across the, the reservoir today and I uh, want the news media out there, and uh, that would get our attention. Wow! Jesus walked on water. He rose those from the uh, death to, uh, from death to life. Uh, he cast out demons. Uh, he performed many one fed, fed five thousand people with a couple of fish and a couple of loaves. I mean, you can go on and on. That's some good fertilization. He tried. He fertilized and dug and fertilized, but nothing changed. Crucify him. We will not have this man. Rule over us. No. Fertilize, fertilize. There's a time element here. You got one year. By the time you get to Acts chapter 7, guys, you got Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church. He's preaching his first and his oh, first recorded sermon and his last recorded sermon. They're going to stone him at the end of the sermon. In fact, they're not going to listen to the rest of the sermon. They're going to gnash on him with their teeth. They're going to cover their ears, and they're going to run on him, and they're going to stone Stephen, first, one of the first deacons. The Bible says he looked up, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. He's not sitting. He's sitting. Now, he was standing then. Do you realize many of commentators, many Bible believers believe right there, that moment, right there, they were given one last opportunity to receive their king. He's standing. I'm ready to come back. They'll just believe, I'm here, I'm coming down. No. You get to Acts chapter 8, you have an open door to Samaria. Now Gentiles are getting, uh, are getting saved. Acts 9, we have Cornelius. Listen, then it turned to the Gentiles. You know what happened? Spiritually speaking, God cut it down. Cut the tree down. He's not finished with the tree, but he cut it down going to rebud. In fact, it rebutted in May 14th, 1948. So it's not dead yet. But he cut it down. AD 70, Titus came in from Rome, destroyed Jerusalem, pillaged Jerusalem, took the gold out of the temple. That's called the dispersia. Jews all over the world dispersed. They had no nation, no sovereign nation for two thousand years. Cut it down. Cut it down. The primary interpretation of Luke 13 verses 5 through 9 is the nation of Israel. But there's an incredible application to the church. I do not believe that the church has replaced Israel. That's replacement theology. I do not believe that. But I do believe that we have, if you would, a lot of application given to us that was given to Israel. A lot of application. In fact, you'll find that repentance was preached by the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance was preached by John the Baptist to a cold, indifferent, heartless nation of Israel during that time. Robbing God of the tithes and offerings, they were just like, oh, I don't know if I want to go to church today. I don't care about going to the temple today. I don't care about worshiping God. I may give to God. I don't know if I, I'm not going to witness. I don't care about things of God. I'm not going to read my Bible. <laughs> Big deal. Okay, I'm going to watch this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go here. I'm going to drink this. Indifferent. Y'all here? And Paul preached repentance. New Testament church, 
is to re preach repentance. And I want to say this. The church has been commissioned to reach the world with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My, again, my question, what do you do with bad news? I'm getting to that. <laughs> but there's an inspection coming. The church has been commissioned to take the gospel to every creature. We're under that commission. I got orders when I was in the military to show up to Fort Polk, Louisiana. I forget what day, June, uh, uh, October, whatever, 11th, 2000, uh, uh, back in the way back in the 1900s. And uh, I remember sitting, I was the only one in the airplane coming into uh, Philadelphia. And, you know, when you take off, I put my orders there uh, under my under my seat there, and we took off, and, I, and we landed a couple hours later. I looked under the seat, and it was gone. I mean, my orders were gone, and that, I'm, under, I'm commissioned. I mean, I've got orders to be at a post, and I don't even know where they're at. And it was all the way in the back of the plane. It slid all the way back, and they found it. I got it back here, and those nice stewardess came up and gave it back to me. I was like, oh, thank you so much. Why? I had to be somewhere. I was under orders. The church is under orders right now. We've been, we've been commissioned. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I want to show you, know this, and lo, I'm with you always, even under the end of the world. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad the news gets, I'm still with you. I'm not leaving you. The church is to be a light. Just like Israel is to be a light to the Gentiles, the church is now the light of the world. The church is to have fruit. The church is to be unspotted. The church is to be ones that reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is to prepare herself to meet the bride. And just like Israel, the church has become dead and heartless, going through the motions full of corruption. The church is largely, largely right now, not interested in anything about the return of Jesus Christ. Not another prophecy message. Not another message of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to hear it. The church today spends more time talking about their disdain for the politicians than their love for souls. That was the same conversation. Hey, Pilate did it. That was a politician. Pilate killed those guys. What are you going to do about it? The church is more... <laughs> the church is more interested in their conversation about overthrowing the government than they are expanding the kingdom of God. What do you do with bad news? Well, I think you look at this parable and the Bible is very clear. You need to repent. Repent. And there's a time element to this thing where it's going to finish up. And do you realize when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he asked the question, and it's interesting, in the question in Luke 18, in verse 8, when the Son of Man returns, will I find faith? Inspection. And when God comes and judges this world, he is not going to start with the LBGTQ community. When God comes and judges this world, he's not going to start with the child molester and the drug pushers and the rapists and the murderers and all the extortioners and all that stuff. He's not going to start there. He's going to start in the house of God. In fact, he says in 1 Peter 4, 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Chainsaw is coming out, guys. Trees about ready to get cut down. Repent. What do you do with bad news? You, you, listen, you're drawn to your need of repentance. What do you do with bad news? Well, when there's next time, there's civil unrest. I know, I'm going to get into Buffalo trading. I'm going to get myself a new 9 millimeter. Now, I love guns. I own a few. There's nothing wrong with getting more. <laughs> Lynn always asks, why do we need another one? because I don't have it. <laughs> okay, I'm okay with that, you know. The answer is not in how many firearms you have and 
how much food you have stored and, and how much things you have to make sure that you're all, no. What do you do with bad news? Listen to me, you repent. And you're drawn to your need of spiritual renewal to produce fruit because the inspection is coming. You look him. Is this church producing any, let me see if there's any, now. Let me get more individual. He's looking at fruit in your life. He's coming to the leaves of your life to see if I can find any. F- oh, yeah, I see that this, yeah, yeah. Boy, they know a lot about conspiracies. Wow, man, they got that down. Whew. Let me see if there's got to be some fruit somewhere in here. Let's see. Oh, they got the none there called treason by John Stormer. Boy, they got all kinds of things that they know, but I don't see any fruit. They're not producing fruit. No souls are being saved. No one is being discipled. No lives are being changed. They're doing nothing to influence anyone for the things of God. Cut it down. Cut it down. Why are you here? I ask this, this is 9 o'clock. Why are you here? Why do you come? Just to be filled with knowledge, to go out of this world and just come back next week to be filled with more knowledge? You all here? Why are you here? When is the last time you gave someone the words of Christ? It's the last time you took someone and said, you know what? Jesus loves you. When's the last time that you were able to engage in a conversation with someone that was asking questions? When's the last time you took time out of your schedule and had dinner with someone for the purpose? I'm not talking about what you get and all the politics and all that junk. I'm not against talking about that stuff, please. What do you do with bad news? You better start looking at repenting. Inspection time is coming. Looking for fruit. Let's see. Oh, yeah, she's pretty good at all kinds of things, but there's got to be some fruit there somewhere. And ladies and gentlemen, can we say this? You can't ask for better fertilizer than we've got in the last 10 years. <laughs> we've been fertilized pretty good. <laughs> and we've been dug <laughs> and we've been dunged. There's been a lot of fertilizer being put into our minds There's a lot of things happening in this world that are showing that the Lord Jesus Christ is returning for his church. What are you doing with the fertilizer? What do you do with bad news? Repent. Repent. If you're not lost, get saved. If you're saved, you better get serving. You better have some fruit. Because it's coming to an end. Let me have one more year. One more year. You know, it's interesting Bible study, guys. That in Acts chapter 7, you look at the date in Acts chapter 7, it was A.D. 26. Actually, A.D. 30. The beginning of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry started approximately A.D. 26. Four years. The time that God said in this parable, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, give it one more year. And the chainsaw came out. (laughs) Well, watch it. The, the, the John said the axe is laid to the root. That's what John's prophecy was, going to be laid to the root. So I say, God, ladies and gentlemen, to the church, no, we're not Israel. No, we're not replacing Israel. But to the church, we are the light of the world. To the church, we are to take this word to this world that is dying in darkness and going to hell. And we cannot be distracted from all the other noise that happens, all the other tragedies. You all with me today? Let's pray. Father, I'm convicted, Lord, of my need. I pray, God, you'd help us. Lord, I pray that you would help the church today as we look inwardly, as we're in the most exciting time In church history, as we're seeing your advent, your second advent, the return of Christ, I pray that we would not be a people that are asleep. You tell us to wake and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of truth. 
Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. today. I pray for one that is here this morning that does not know where they're going to go if they died, that they would get saved before it's eternally too late, that they would stop looking at all these news stories saying, oh boy, those people are bad, but Lord, look at themselves and be ready that if something unexpected happens to them, they would be ready to go home. I pray they would get saved before it's too late. Bless this time together. Thank you for the opportunity to respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's just quietly stand to our feet. This is the altar call. Very important time of the church service. We'll be out of here in just a minute. But if you have been spoken to by God, maybe there's an area in your life that say, I'm just not as fruitful as I like to be. Altar is open. If there's someone on your heart this morning that you're praying for, the altar is open. Have we become a people that are just used to being saved and silent with the gospel? Altar is open. Altar is open. Inspection is coming. you're here and say, Pastor, if I died, I'm not sure that I'd go to heaven. I'd like to pray for you this morning. Would you slip your hand up and down and say, Pastor, I don't know where I'm going to go. I don't know. I'm religious. I've been baptized, but I don't know where I'm going to go if I died. But I'd like to know. Would you slip your hand up and down and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'd, I'd like to know that. I'll take a Bible and I can show you out of the Bible how you could be saved. Very important. Amen. All right. It is good to be in the house of God. It is good to be a place where we can meet with our Lord. We can seek his face. That God would work in those in this congregation. We're certainly a, a needy people. And I, I don't want you to leave here thinking, man, I, God, God is already through with me. He's not, man. You, if you're alive, you've got a plan. God's got a plan for you. And uh, pick up that gospel track and give it to someone. Talk to someone. Kids, you're here this morning. You're, you've got a job to do this week. Amen. You're going to be inviting your neighbors and your friends to come to church and uh, bring them to church. And uh, we'll look forward to a good full house next week and the beginning of SSBC. Amen. Let's ask the Lord's blessings. Take us home safely and uh, bring us back for the Sunday school tonight. And uh, looking forward to meeting back together. Back in the meeting house. Amen. Praise God. Let's ask the Lord's blessings. Take us home safely. It's good to be here. Brother Bob, peace. Would you dismiss us in service? Prayer, sir. On behalf of Cornerstone Baptist Church, thank you for visiting us today. If you're a first time visitor, if you would go to the website, finley.church slash visitor and fill out a visitor's card and let us get some information about our church to you. If you made a decision today for Christ, again, go to the website, 
finley.church slash decision. And we're gonna send you a book called Done by Carrie Schmidt. It's just a book that gives you next steps in your walk with Christ. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you would subscribe to it, what that does, it gets the message of the gospel outside of these four walls around the world. If you watch us on Facebook, if you would just like us, again, it does the same thing. And again, thank you for visiting with us. But the most important decision that you can make is a decision for Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about how to go to heaven, give us a call. Our phone number is 419-420-8222. Call us right away. I'd like to personally talk with you and, and help you to know what it is to have peace in Jesus Christ and know that when you leave this world, you're going to heaven. Th again, thank you for coming. Visit us soon.